thank you for lending your voice to pray with us. So uh, obviously we are singing the Lord's Prayer and uh, that is one way to pray. I want you to take note uh, each week when we sing, many of the songs that we sing are prayers. And so we're singing them together. We're praying collectively. Thank you for giving your voice to that. I want to welcome those of you who are with us here in person. Welcome those of you who are joining us online and ask you to find your way to Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14 you know, this is a great time in the life of our church, and it's a great time because we are $2,000 or so away from adding the final region to our Annie Armstrong map, and uh, frankly, it doesn't matter to me whether I have to wear an Alabama tie or not, but Alabama fans, it is on you. It's like it's in the fourth quarter. You're driving down the field. Do you have the energy to get this done or not? I don't know. Maybe you'll try to kick a field goal. It'll come up a little short, and we'll run it all the way back down the field. It's really the ball is in your hands. That's all I want to say about that, and I'll move along, except I will say some of the LSU fans have said, hey, what about us? I'm open to negotiation. Make an appointment in the office. We can see what we can do. But, uh, you know, we, wanna, we just want to see the, the kingdom of Jesus spread all over uh, the, the planet. And so uh, if you don't know, if we reach our $20,000 goal, then uh, I'll preach in an Alabama tie chosen by Tommy Quinn. And so that's, um, that's what we're, we're working towards. But I do want to say this. Even if we don't reach that goal already, you have given $3,000 more this year than we gave the church last year. So I'm very excited about that, and that at the end of the day is what really matters. I also want to note to you that sometimes in the past, I've been in ministry for 25 years, and I remember 25 years ago, it's just what we did as a church. We'd give a little gift to the moms, maybe a flower or something like that. And over the years, we've done different things. And starting last year, we we took a different strategy. Uh, we have, and this is inside of your worship guide if you want the details about it, uh, in honor of the ladies and the moms of First Baptist Tillman's Corner, we have made a gift in your honor uh, to the Compassion International Project that we're working to sponsor in uh, Indonesia. And so a $500 gift has been made in honor of the ladies and mothers of First Baptist Tillman's Corner. Uh, we felt like that would mean much more to you as it goes to advance the mission. They're just getting started. We're trying to help them do that through our sponsorships, but also they have other needs. And so we just made a gift uh, so they could use that money anywhere they need it. And we wanted to do that to honor our ladies and our mothers. Well, I want to transition now into Revelation chapter 14 and ask you this question. Have you ever missed an important message? Have you ever missed an important message? Now, because I'm a pastor and I feel like I should be a servant leader, I try to receive messages anywhere people want to send them. So in other words, if you choose to communicate through this medium or that medium, I try to keep up with those messages. So I want to give you a list of places where I have missed important messages, and maybe you'll feel, uh, maybe you'll you'll uh, feel like I feel, or maybe one of your messages is one of the ones I've missed, and I'd like to say publicly, I'm sorry for missing your message. Uh, but how about this? I have missed important messages in email. Have you ever missed an important email? You check three or four months later, and somehow you didn't see it, or somebody says, I emailed that to you. You say, no, you didn't. And you search your email, and there it is. What about voicemail? You're in the middle of a meeting. Somebody calls, and you see them call, and you see that they leave a voicemail, and you say, well, when I get out of this meeting, I'm going to check that voicemail, and then you forget, and it's three or four weeks later, and you haven't checked that voicemail. Could also be your answering machine, but I've been married now for 18 years, and you know in my married life, I've never actually owned an answering machine. Uh, so I have never missed an important message that I know of on an answering machine. Then, of course, there's text message. Text message comes through, and you might see it come through. I'll check that later, and you forget to check. I've missed important messages on uh, through a textbook. Then there's group me. You sign up for a baseball team, they sign up for another group, they add you to the group me, and they communicate important information. Just this last week, I missed an important message on group me. Then at work, to make things easier so we can communicate with one another, as though we don't have 10,000 other uh, ways to communicate with one another, we use Microsoft Teams. So I have missed important messages from our staff on Microsoft Teams. Then there's Facebook. Someone might post something and tag you in it, and you miss it. Or they might reply to a post that you've made to give you an important message, and you miss it. And that doesn't even uh, 
take into account Facebook Messenger. I've missed important messages on Facebook Messenger for a long time. I didn't even know Facebook Messenger existed, and then I found it, and I found all these messages that people had sent to me, and then I found the other messages. Are you getting my messages? Well, no, I'm not getting your messages. And then there's a spam folder on Facebook Messenger, and most of it are legitimate spam attempts, but many of the messages that go to my spam folder are from actual church members trying to reach out because many times they'll start off by saying, how are you doing? And then the next question will be an important question. But when Facebook sees that, how are you doing? They automatically assume it's spam and they send it to the spam folder. So I've missed important messages on both Facebook posts and Facebook Messenger. Then there's Instagram and Twitter and LinkedIn, which all have messaging sides to them. And I've missed important messages there. Then there's something called mail. Comes in the mailbox. Zach will hold it in your hand. I have, there are seven people that live in our house. Most of the time, one of my five children checks the mail for us. So that mail might end up in the little mailbox that we have for mail, or it might end up on the counter or on the table or stuffed underneath the box or in the tree house or at the neighbor's house. There's no telling where that mail might end up. So I have missed important messages that have come through the mail. And then on top of all that, I have a mailbox at work, which is separate from the mail that comes through my mailbox at at home and there will be things that get put into placed into my mailbox at work and then something else gets placed on top of it that doesn't look particularly important so I never actually look in the mailbox at work and I've missed important messages there so if I've missed your message can I say I'm sorry <laughs> I hope you understand living the 21st century how easy it is to miss an important message but in today's passage We have for us, written in black and white, having been there for 2,000 years, three important messages. So important are these messages that they are delivered, each of them, by an angel, a messenger of God. That's the role of an angel to deliver an important message. And we might be able to afford to miss other messages, but we cannot miss these messages. Would you read with me Revelation chapter 14, beginning in verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made the heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Another angel, a second followed saying, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. And another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he will also drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger. And he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. And they have no rest day or night, these worshipers of the beast and its image, and whoever receives the mark of its name. Here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. There are three messages from three angels in this passage, and Really, it can all be summed up in one message. It can be summed up in this way. When you reject the message of judgment, you reject the gospel. Now, I know some of you are already thinking, Pastor, is this really the message to preach on Mother's Day? And I'll tell you that there are many churches who would not preach this message on Mother's Day. And I'm not saying that as a badge of honor or some kind of badge of pride. I didn't choose this message for Mother's Day. It's simply where it fell on the calendar. And even then, there was a temptation to say, well, maybe not on Mother's Day. But uh, as I thought about that and prayed about that, I thought, no, this is the passage that God has laid out. Perhaps someone who is here today particularly needs to hear this message. There are many churches, not only that would skip over this message on Mother's Day, there are many churches and pastors who would not even touch this message. They wouldn't want you to hear this message. Now, I want you to see that in this passage, God goes to great lengths to deliver this message to an angel, his official messenger. Those angels are used to deliver messages such as the one that was brought to Joseph about Mary, the one that was brought to Mary about Jesus, the one that was brought to the shepherds about 
Jesus' birth. So those angels are used for these important official announcements. So God says to an angel, go and take this message to those who dwell on earth. How dare we as a church say, no, I'll skip this message. It's not our message to deliver. It's God's message, and it is our job to deliver it. So today you have this message here before you, and it is a difficult message. It's a difficult message to hear. It's a difficult message to preach, but it is a message we must hear. And it's a message that if we reject it, we reject the gospel. In fact, these three messages that we must hear all are tied into the gospel. Let's start with the first message from the first angel. It is simply this, judgment is coming. So another angel flies. That other angel, compared to the angels that have been given to us this thus far up in the book of Revelation that deliver messages. God has delivered, used angels on several occasions already to deliver messages. And he has a message that is titled the, an eternal gospel. And this is the gospel, the gospel that God saves. But there's a different emphasis in this delivery of the gospel than there are, uh, than the emphases in most other uh, givings of the gospel. So it's good news, that's what the word gospel means, it's good news, but this message is about judgment. What is the message? The hour of judgment has come. So the hour is here. We've come to that point in Revelation where we've gone through the seven seals, we've gone through the seven trumpets, the seven bowls are yet to come, but they happen very quickly. We are right on the precipice of it all being wrapped up, and the message is judgment is here. It's at hand. It is right now, and so this message is given. And it's interesting to think about the gospel being described in that way, the gospel being described as a message of judgment. However, I want you to think about this. The gospel without judgment is no gospel at all. The gospel is the good news that we don't have to face the judgment of God if we choose to repent and believe. So if we don't know what we're being saved from, we don't understand salvation. When we gut the gospel of the message of judgment, which is the trend in 21st century America, and it was already starting in 20th century America, but when we pull the judgment out, when we say people won't sit to hear the message of judgment anymore, so let's take the message of judgment out and just talk about grace, the message of grace doesn't make any sense without the message of judgment. Last night, there was a showdown at our house, and it was a very difficult showdown. It was between me and my two-year-old son, Marshall. Now, if you know much about two-year-olds, they have a little bit more autonomy than they're used to having. We believe in our family. We believe in the terrible ones, not the terrible twos, because they have less tools during, when they're one. And so between one and two is a great time to teach them that the world is not all about them, despite the best efforts of their grandparents to teach them exactly the opposite message. However, if you'll teach them the world's not all about them, when they're a little younger and they don't have quite as many tools, then it'll make things go a little easier in your parenting. So we do believe that, but some of that spills over into the two. So last night at uh, our house, there was an issue. Our two-year-old three times did something directly that his mother told him not to do, and the third time was directly after she told him not to do it. So, okay, it's time for dad to intervene. We're going to get a spanking. Yes, we do spank at our house, but we do reserve it for moments of clear rebellion. So this is clearly rebellion. So there's, there's going to be a spanking here. And we try to spank them when they're young so that when they're older, they've gotten the message. So get him out of his seat. He knows what's coming, uh, but he has to put his hands on the seat. So at our house, when you get a spanking, it is not so much about the spanking itself. It's about submitting to the authority of the parents. So put your hands on the seat. That was what I told him. Got him out of the seat. Put your hands on the seat. Well, guess what? He didn't want to put his hands on the seat. <laughs> so a battle began. There were several spankings without him putting his hands on the seat with the command, put your hands on the seat. Marshall, put your hands on the seat. Now, I want to be really clear. It was hard for Marshall. It was virtually impossible for me. But I want you to know, once I get into this battle, I can't lose this battle. And it's not about me, by the way. It, it's about him. And he understands that his mother and I are the authority over him. And it's also about his siblings. See, this is not a small thing here. This is him recognizing that in this house, he does what his mother and father say. There's an authority over him. And he submits to that authority. And our other children recognizing there's an authority in this house. And we submit to that authority. And it's bigger even than that. It is about my grandchildren not yet born 
and establishing that God has placed authority in this world because the ultimate authority is God himself. And we all submit to authority. So see, for Marshall there in that moment to just simply rebel or for us as parents to give in and go, you know what, don't worry about it. It's not that big of a deal. You don't have to put your hands on the seat. This is a major moment. I know this is a battle for his sake, for my other children's sake, for my grandchildren not yet born. This is a battle I can't lose. You're putting too much importance on this battle. I don't think I am. So we have this battle. Mommy, mommy, mommy. Well, that's hard to hear. I'm rejecting my dad, and I want mommy to intervene. Well, mommy does intervene, but guess what? She sides with dad. So mommy comes over. Marshall, you need to put your hands on the seat. You put your hands on the seat, and this will all be over. Just put your hands on the seat. So at one point, he walked up to the seat with his hands right here, and he put his forehead, just like that. I do not want to put my hands on this seat. Eventually, now, our other children, unfortunately, this happened at dinner, so all of our other children were watching, and at some point, our other children were like literally up on their knees watching what was happening, and another point, this is a fact, what I'm telling you with my hand up, all of the children were under the table hiding so they didn't have to see what was going on. It was a difficult, tense moment at our home. So eventually, Marshall musters up the obedience to put his hands on the seat. And when he does, we all erupt in applause. We scoop him up. We hug him. Yay, you finally, you did it. You say, well, he didn't get his spanking. He got like 87,000 spankings on the way to that. It was good. He did what we asked him to do. He submitted, and we moved on as a family, and we made sure he knew he's still a part of the family. We still love him. This doesn't change anything about that. He is forgiven, and he is still loved. So, There's something bigger going on here. See, he received mercy. When he put his hands on the seat, he thought he was going to get judgment. When he submitted, he thought he was going to be punished. Why? Because he knew the threat of punishment was real. So when he finally submitted and put his hands on the seat, and we embraced him with grace and mercy, that grace and mercy meant something to him. Had there been no threat of punishment, no real threat of punishment, then that grace and mercy would have meant nothing to him. The gospel without judgment is no gospel at all. Judgment is coming. So when we reject that message that judgment is coming, understand we reject the entire gospel. It all falls apart. So the eternal news, the eternal gospel, good news that judgment is coming, and this is proclaimed to those who dwell on earth. That's Revelation's way of saying those who have rejected Jesus all throughout, I believe eight times in the book of Revelation, that phrase, those who dwell on earth, is used to speak about those who have rejected Jesus as Messiah. And so that phrase, this gospel is proclaimed to those who dwell on earth, which means what? There's hope for them. There's hope for them. If there's hope for them at the end of the end, there's hope for you in this room or watching online today. There is hope for you to hear the gospel and to repent. What's the message? There's judgment coming, so fear God, give him glory, worship him, submit to him. See, this is not so much about the work of your hands. I've done this, I've done that. It's about your submission to the Lord because sometimes you look at the work of your hands and you say, well, the work of my hands is not really that bad. I mean, I'm not a murderer. I'm not a serial adulterer. Yeah, I've done this or that here or there, but it's not that bad. But if your heart is in rebellion to God and you are not submitted to God, then you are not under the authority of God and you are under the judgment of God and you are not under the grace of God. It's about that heart refusing to submit to God. Almighty God, who is the ultimate authority over us. Well, there are three messages here. The first is about judgment that is coming. The second message is this. Judgment is coming to the systems of the world. So the second angel makes this proclamation. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. Babylon, Babylon gets its start back in Genesis chapter 11, almost back to the very beginning. Babylon, or Babel at that point, is the first time that humans organize their rebellion against God. 
there had been a person here that had sinned against God. That person sins against God. Everyone sinned against God. But at Babel's, the first time they say, hey, let's get together and organize our rebellion against God. And from that point forward, in Scripture, Babylon is that place that represents organized rebellion against God. Babylon the Great only referenced one other time in Scripture, Daniel chapter 4, verse 30, when Nebuchadnezzar, one of the most powerful men to ever walk the face of the earth, is walking around looking at Babylon, and he says, look at this great Babylon that I have built with my own hands, and in that moment, God judged him. Read about it in Daniel chapter 4. So Babylon the Great, what does it represent? It represents organized, systematic rebellion against God of cultures and nations and groups, and so that's what we have here. In the first century, it was the Roman Empire. They are Babylon, and they are organized against God, they've set up this system, this system where Christians were brought into Roman tribunals and told to make this statement, Caesar is Lord. And if you don't say Caesar is Lord and and admit that you're part of this emperor worship, then you'll lose your life. And many of them did. Lindsay and I had the opportunity to go stand in a hippodrome in Caesarea Maritime, and we stood right there and thought, you know, we don't know the numbers, but potentially hundreds, maybe even more, maybe even thousands of Christians right here in this place lost their lives to animals, to gladiators, to untold atrocities simply because they would not open their mouth to utter the phrase, Caesar is Lord, when commanded to do so by Roman officials. They instead would utter that great confession of faith. Jesus is Lord. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead. You will be saved, Romans chapter 10, verse 9. So that's what the Roman government was doing at that time. In that way, serving is this system set up in rebellion against God. And certainly those systems still exist today, even though Babylon is dead to history. Rome is dead to history. We have systems like North Korea, the North Korean government that oppresses its people systematically. We have the Chinese government that especially in the last decade has really turned its glance towards the Christian church to snuff it out. We have, as we've watched unfold in the news, we've seen Both situations in Afghanistan where the Taliban has taken back over and they systematically crush out any faith in Jesus Christ. And then we have this uh, systematic uh, rebellion against the laws of Western civility and the invasion of Russia into Ukraine. And we're watching the atrocities that are taking place there. So we see this systematic rebellion. Well, I want you to know that judgment is coming to those systems. Those systems will not eternally get away with what they've done. Those systems will be judged and those leaders will answer for what they have done. Babylon the Great has fallen. It seems like they can't fall. It seems like no one has the ability or the will or the combination of both to stop Vladimir Putin. It seems like no matter what we do, we can't crack the case of stopping North Korea. We can't do too much, right? They have nuclear weapons. China's so big, they have a massive economy. They have so much power. What can we really do to help Christians there? And they have so much influence in the world. And it seems like they're unstoppable. But judgment is coming to the systems of the world. And we need to recognize that corporate sin is real. Corporate sin is real. So, too, it is for us, those who are not caught up in any way in the Babylonian uh, proper rebellion. We're not citizens of Babylon. We are not citizens even of Rome or North Korea or Russia or China, but we do need to recognize that even for American culture, there are corporate sins of American culture. There are many things that we represent as a nation and as a corporate group that are so positive, freedom spread all over the world, the rights of individuals, religious freedom, even even in taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. But there are other things we have exported as Americans that we need to understand are not so positive. So Babylon, the great, she who made all the nations drink of the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. What that phrase means is that she was passionate. She was passionate and she was forceful and said, if you want to do business with us, if you want to be a part of us, if you want to be part of the end culture, if you want your economy to work, if you want to be part of the international club, if you will, then you've got to participate in the things that we participate in. The sexual immorality, yes, meaning just simple sexual immorality that was much of the Babylonian culture and the Roman culture, but also the 
the formalized sexual immorality, meaning that if you participate in emperor worship or in these cults, there was uh, sexual immorality that was involved in them. And then even the picture of idolatry being sexual immorality. So many times when God's people would rebel against him and worship an idol, the Bible describes it as sexual immorality. You are supposed to be betrothed to the Lord and you are going after all these other gods, sexual immorality. So too, we have done our fair share of spreading such things across the world. In fact, we, the number one export of America for some time has been our culture. And there are many positive aspects of American culture we spread, but we need to recognize there are many negative a- exports. You know, America is the number one exporter of music around the world. And we do more to export music. People listen to American music all over the world, and it's not the Gaither family homecoming they're listening to. Just think about it. Think about the full picture of American music. What are the messages? What's the morality? What's the moral message that's going out to the world that is broadcast from here and originates from here? What about movies? Number one exporter of movies around the world. We have done more to spread movies. Every corner of the globe literally has American movies showing in that location. What do our movies portray? They portray the same immorality that's portrayed in our music. It's not that there aren't good movies that go out, but there are many, many bad movies that are portraying a message we would not want them to portray. Then there are the tech companies that are behind so much of the immorality that's being pushed now and themselves take many immoral actions. They become in many ways more powerful than most if not all of the governments on the earth and they are exports of American culture. Then there's pornography. Over the last 30 to 40 years, no nation on earth, and remember we're 5% of the world's population by the way, So we have a massively outsized influence in the world. No nation has done more to promote and push. You say, well, our nation hasn't done that. Yeah, but the people of our nation have, and the cultural system of our nation has done this. No country has done more to promote pornography. At one point, uh, very recently, I I don't have the most up-to-date stats on this. I actually don't think research is being done on this anymore, but the last available research that I could find, which was in the mid-2010s, 80% of the world's pornography was produced and distributed from the United States of America. 5% of the world's population, 80% of the world's pornography. Then there's sexual immorality thanks to the sexual revolution. The sexual revolution wasn't only started in America, but it certainly was spread by American culture and ideals through our movie, through our movies, through our music, through the pornography that goes out, through the tech companies that support these types of messages. Judgment will come to those systems. So we ought not get too comfortable with those systems. We'll see it in great detail in weeks to come. The one of the most difficult positions to be in when judgment comes is to be so tied in to these systems that when their judgment comes, you get swept up in that judgment. See, it's easy to do because they're so powerful. They're so prominent. They're so successful. They're so prosperous. So I want to get connected and tied into those cultures, not recognizing that whatever you give to that culture, whatever you give to that system will be swept away in judgment because judgment is coming on the systems of the world. It's the third message that we have to see here. Not only is judgment coming on the systems of the world, judgment is coming to those who reject Jesus. It's just really easy, especially in the 21st century, to say, yeah, those systems are bad. In fact, all the problems are systematic, right? We, we live in a world where we want to say all the problems are systematic. There's systematic immorality. There's systematic uh, racism. There's systematic this. There's systematic that. We want to put it all into a system. But you know what a system is? A system is a group of individuals working together. <laughs> so just because you say the system is broken doesn't mean that you get to get a pass on the individual. In fact, that's really the most intense message here is saved not for Babylon the Great. The most intense message is saved here in verses 9 through 11 for the individuals who are part of that system. So you can't just simply say, oh yeah, the world's a bad place. Hey, there's some things I don't like about American culture. I wish they were different. Glad they're going to be judged one day. 
No, we have to look individually and recognize that judgment is coming individually to those who reject Jesus. Another angel, the third angel, follows them. He says, if anyone, if anyone worships the beast, we are familiar with John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, aren't you glad it says whosoever? It means you can be anybody from anywhere. It doesn't matter who you have been or what you've done recently or what you've done in your past, you can be saved. Well, so too it is with those who worship the beast. If anyone worships the beast, if anyone worships the beast and worships his image and takes his mark, oh, see, there it is, pastor. I'll never take the mark of the beast. I'm not going to let anybody put something on my hand or my forehead. I will not do that. Do you not recognize that, see, the inevitable conclusion of worshiping the beast is receiving the image. So you can't work backwards. You can't say, well, I'll make sure I never get a mark. See, if all it took was getting a mark, then it'd be pretty easy for the followers of the beast just to recruit more people. They could simply drug us and we'd wake up, suddenly we'd have a mark on our hands, nothing we can do. We'd go down to the doctor, think we're getting one thing and they're giving us another thing. That's why I told my doctor, I'm not getting that shot. You're not going to give me that shot. See, the mark of the beast will not sneak up on you. The mark of the beast will come to all of those who choose to get the mark, who choose to worship the beast, and it will come to no one who rejects the worship of the beast. So the way to protect yourself from the mark is simply to worship Jesus and refuse to deny him. There's no other way to miss the mark. So you can't say, well, hey, I'm really not into Jesus, but one thing's for sure. I know I will not take the mark of the beast. If you have rejected Jesus, you might as well already have the mark of the beast. Whether it's a physical mark or a spiritual mark, whether it's symbolic or literal, doesn't really matter. What matters is have you rejected Jesus in favor of the beast? Well, I certainly don't worship the beast. What is the beast? The beast out of the sea, the beast out of the earth. That comes from Revelation chapter 13. It's what we most often call the Antichrist. And you say, well, I'm not on the Antichrist team. But you realize that since from the first century on, ever since there was a Christ, there have been Antichrists. Tens of thousands of opportunities for you to say, I am Antichrist. I am rebelling against Jesus. So we come back to that point of rebellion again. And I want you to understand this. I want to be very clear about this. You do not have to sign a piece of paper somewhere that says, I support the Antichrist in order to be following the Antichrist. In fact, if you are, listen to me so clearly, if you are not submitted to the lordship of Jesus Christ, you are already following the Antichrist. I don't like the way that sounds, Pastor. Me neither, but it's true. You say, well, why are you coming after me? I'm not. I'm just trying to tell you what Scripture says. I'm just trying to show you here that anyone, me, you, anyone who rejects Jesus is following the beast, the Antichrist. If anyone worships the beast, the wine of God's wrath is poured out. You remember when Jesus is in the garden of Gethsemane, he prayed a prayer. He said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. What cup? Well, the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament, says over and over again that God's wrath is like a cup. It's like a cup of wine, full strength. And to face God's wrath is to drink the wine of God's wrath. So Jesus is in the garden. He says, Father, I don't want to drink this cup. It wasn't the crucifixion. It wasn't the rejection by men. It was the fact that he would be taking on the wrath of God for sin. That's what Jesus did not want to face. Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Well, that's the same cup. So this passage tells us that those who reject Jesus... They are faced with the cup of God's wrath, full strength. It's not watered down. It's full strength, God's wrath. So here's the basic truth we, we've got to understand. Someone is going to drink God's wrath for our sin. It will either be Jesus or it will be you. It's only one of two ways. Remember Jesus' prayer. If it be possible, what does that mean? If there's any other way, 
If there's any other way, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. If there's a way that I don't have to drink this cup and people can still be saved, people can be, still be part of the kingdom, First Baptist Tillman's Corner can still be a part of my eternal kingdom, if, the, if, there's, if it's possible that there's any other way that we can do this, then let this cup pass from me. What was God's answer? The Father answered the Son the only time we have recorded that the Father said no to Jesus. And Jesus submitted Nevertheless, not my will, but yours. It was the Father's will that Jesus drink the cup of his wrath. Why? Because God would rather Jesus drink the cup of wrath for sin than you drink the cup of wrath for sin. See, that's called grace. That is God's amazing grace. Why would we reject that? Why would we say no to that? Why would we say, Jesus has already paid the price, but I want to pay it myself? Why would we say that? But yet we will. We refuse to repent. We refuse to submit, not knowing that the threat of judgment, the threat of very real judgment, is intended to lead us to the mercy that God really wants to give us. So it's the cup of God's wrath, full strength, They will be tormented in the presence of the Lamb and the holy angels. This is not a victory lap of Jesus. No, this is a judge presiding over a trial, ensuring that, in fact, justice is served to those who have rejected the message of the gospel, the message of grace. The Bible says the torment goes on forever and ever, and there is no rest. You know, we live, again, in an interesting time, first time in church history, that even pastors and theologians have tried to convince us that judgment is just the natural consequence of sin. God's not actively involved in judgment. Judgment's just kind of like you don't live your life well, or maybe you drive down the road at high speeds without a seatbelt on, and you have a crash, and you get hurt. It's just the natural consequence of sin. Nobody's really coming after you with this. Well, that's not true. That's not true at all. No, judgment is God's wrath against sin. You say, well, Why would God want to pour out his wrath on me against sin? He doesn't. That's why he poured it out on Jesus. But if you're not in Christ, then there is nowhere else for the wrath to go. So God, yes, actively judging sin. That's what judgment is. There are those who want to say, well, judgment's not really going to be that bad. It's going to be like living in a bad part of town, but all your friends are going to be there, and yeah, it won't be the best, and others will have better places to live, and you won't won't be so bad. That's not what the Bible says. Look at it. The Bible says it is torment. The smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. Well, that's metaphorical, Pastor, but it's not a metaphor for something good. So Some people have said, well, judgment is always described in metaphorical terms in Scripture, therefore it must not be that bad. It's the correct statement, but it's the wrong conclusion. It is true that judgment is always described in metaphorical terms in Scripture, but it's not because judgment is something better than the metaphor. It's because judgment is something worse than the metaphor. We can't even understand how bad it is to be separated from God in a place that is totally godless and ruled by evil and sin, the sin that we bring in. So God uses metaphors. But it's not better than the metaphors. It's worse than the metaphors are able to portray. It's torment. And then there are others who have said, well, don't worry about judgment. Judgment is once and done. God just simply annihilates his enemies and they are no more. But that is not what Scripture teaches Right here in this passage, you have read it twice. The smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. Judgment. It's God's wrath and anger against sin. It is torment, and it is eternal. You might be here thinking, see, this is why I don't come to church. Because all I hear is judgment. I came today because I wanted to make my mother happy and give her a gift, and I'm thankful that you're here if you came for that reason. You say, but here we are talking about judgment. Have you ever thought that God went to great lengths to send three angels to have this message, and that today of all days, I didn't choose this passage. We've just been preaching through Revelation, and we have just today come to this passage. 
Did you ever think that God in his loving kindness has brought you here today to sit in this seat or to watch online to hear this warning that had you come in this room and just heard a great message about the love of God and how it's like the love of a mother, you might very well have missed this warning. And you might not know of the judgment that is to come. It's easy to go throughout life. In the 21st century, there are plenty of things to distract us and forget about the seriousness of this moment. But this moment is coming. You know, it's interesting how the judgment here that's coming is contrasted with the punishment that the beast will give to those who refuse to worship him. Revelation 13, 15 tells us about that punishment. He says, the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. The beast will be given power to kill those who will not worship him. But do you understand that his power ends in death? There is nothing that he can do to you beyond the grave. The worst he can do to you at worst ends at your death and life begins on the other side of that. That's why the angel can say, blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on. It's difficult to die for the Lord, but it's blessed to die for the Lord. But those who choose to go along with the beast so that life here is better, so that the culture is not so much against you, so that you don't have so many issues living out your life here in 21st century culture. And those are the ones who are rebelling in active rebellion against Jesus. Those are the ones who face the harsher judgment. Well, how do we respond to this? John doesn't leave us with that question. He tells us, here is a call for the endurance of, of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. So John says, first, we respond to this by holding fast to faith in Jesus. Hold fast to faith in Jesus. Don't let it go. Don't forget this message was written first not to people who were lost to become saved, but to people who were saved, who were in the church, not to leave the church, not to walk away from the faith those who are professing Christ, to hold to their faith in Christ. And listen, in in the culture that we live in, it's really easy right now to go, "Mm, it'd be a lot easier. My life would be a lot easier. I'd have a lot more friends. I'd have a lot more opportunities in the world. And it just wouldn't be as much of a burden to just kind of, like I'm not going to deny Jesus, but I'll just kind of distance myself from Jesus. And it'll be something that was important to me at one point in my life, but it's really not that important to me anymore. And it'll make things go a lot easier for me. And the message from Revelation from the first century to the 21st century is hold fast to your faith in Jesus. It is the only hope that you have. There is no other hope. Hold fast to your faith in Jesus and to the commandments of God. See, there's this other route right now. This is really popular in our culture. In fact, so many churches are taking this route right now. Oh, no, we believe in Jesus. Hey, death, burial, resurrection, return, we're all there, gospel. Got to believe in Jesus. Got to place your faith in Jesus. But listen, this morality stuff, it's not that we deny it. We just got to kind of push it to the background. We can't really talk so much about what the Bible clearly says about morality. We can't say that anymore because it's out of step with what the culture believes about morality. So we've got to kind of hide that right now. We can't talk about that. So let's distance ourselves from that where what Scripture says, you read it. I didn't write it. God wrote it. Hold fast to the commandments of God. Do not let them go. The culture will try to rip them out of your hand. They'll try to slip them out of your hand. They'll try to get them any way that they can. They will try to get you to let loose of the commands of God. Do not do it. Hold fast to faith in Jesus and keep the commandments of God. Do not let them go. And then for Christians, finally, choose to die for Christ rather than deny Christ it will likely for us not come in the form that it did for those first century Christians. You make the statement, Caesar is Lord, and you keep your life. You do not make it, and you lose your life. It will likely not come for us in that way. But it will come for us in a death by a thousand cuts. You miss the promotion. You miss out on the party. You're not invited to the circle of people who go and hang out on Friday night, and that's really where all the wheeling and dealing is done. So you miss out on life because you are, you're not part of them. So you get pushed out. Death by a thousand cuts. Choose to die rather than deny Christ. And there may come a day, as there have for several Americans, and especially American missionaries, 
where indeed it is the choice between your literal physical life and denying Christ. Choose to die for Christ rather than deny Christ. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed that they may rest from their labors. For those who cling to Christ, there is rest. For those who deny Christ, there is no rest. So, if you do not know the Lord here today, you say, well, this is kind of a message for Christians. I want to go back to the very beginning. Who was this message preached to by that angel? To those who dwell on earth. Why would God send an angel out at the end of the end of the end To tell people, judgment is coming. Worship the Lord. Fear him. Give him glory. Submit to him. Why? Because God is a God of infinite grace. And to the very end, God is screaming from heaven through the voice, a great voice of an angel. Repent and give him glory. You have that opportunity. So if you're here today, you say, well, it's not the end of the end of the end. As far as we know, you have that opportunity all the more today to repent and to place your faith in Jesus. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for your word and for the opportunity you've given us to hear your word today. Lord, this is a difficult message to hear, but Lord, it is a message you've loved us enough to give us. Father, I pray that you would write it on our hearts, that you would draw and compel us to be obedient to you in whatever way you've moved on our hearts this morning. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.